Well, I'll say, bless the Lord. If you say, oh, my soul, bless the Lord. Bless his holy name. Wow, you guys sound great singing tonight. We're enthusiastic. Um, if you're uh, new with us or have been with us long enough but just haven't had the courage to ask and wonder what's up with every time I come out, I say, bless the Lord, and ask you guys to say, oh, my soul, and then I say, bless his holy name. Um, one, it's scripture. Uh, it's a great habit for a pastor to get into. First thing that he says is scripture. Uh, yeah, that's Psalm 103, one. Two, I talked a lot when I was a kid in class and in church, and I thought if I ever become a pastor, I'm gonna give you a chance to talk. So that's one way for you guys to get that out there and help me um, heal from my childhood issues, so thank you for that. And then also, it's just, it's like our secret verbal handshake that everybody knows. It's a great pattern that we try to set forth that helps trigger your mind into, okay, now there's a transition into the preaching of God's word, and that's one of my favorite things to do. But you also may be wondering, yeah, that's fine for you, Chris, but what about those other little repetitive phrases that you guys like to sprinkle throughout the service, like little sprinkles, right? <laughs> um, the one Boggs and Matty Mo do, glory to the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, who was and is and is to come. You're like, wow, that one's cumbersome. Um, how about when Jacoby reads the text, uh, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Wow, that, that one's weird. And then in the end, we, we get so crazy with liturgical or repetitive phrases, we set one to music. That sounds like it belongs in a pipe organ from the 16th century. Phantom of the Opera's over there playing it. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Right, that one. And then it calls it Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Like, uh, he hasn't gone by that since the 1970s, okay? It's Holy Spirit, if you haven't got the update. Um, why do you guys do all that stuff? Great question. What, somebody came up afterwards and asked me if I was a Catholic refugee seeking asylum in a Baptist church. <laughs> uh, I, I said, go and sin no more, my son. Um, <laughs> Uh, I said, thank you very much. Uh, I love it when we defy denominational stereotypes and instead embrace the centrality of Jesus Christ and his gospels, and we are willing to borrow from all different styles of worship and different generations. Um, and so those things are important to me. Uh, one of the reasons that we do some of those, uh, just historically get familiar, most of them are four centuries old, if not older, um, glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who was and is and is to come is from the fourth century. Um, when we do uh, the doxology, praise God from whom all his blessings flow, that was written in the late 16th century um, by a college pastor, if you will, or and a scholar at Westminster. And he wanted to create some prayers for students and faculty. And it was set to music and it's been sung throughout the church throughout generations and continents ever since, so much so that it prompted one person to write, nothing has done more to teach the church the doctrine of the Trinity than that song, more so than any theological book ever written, which is why our songwriters have such a great responsibility in the church today. Um, and so those are just some of the reasons why we do some of those things. Um, but also, at least for me personally, you just need to know I want us to always anchor our worship services in the word of God and the truths of God at every point that we can, making sure that it's interactive and we're making sure we're keeping pace with him throughout the service. Now, don't get me wrong. Kairos is gonna continue to be a place where we experiment in creative and biblical ways of encountering the resurrected Jesus and I've got no problems leaning into the spirit and trying to figure things out, even when it gets weird or unusual, um, but I want to make sure that we always have ruts of righteousness, habits of holiness, doctrinal rebarb, if you will, that we pour our emotions and our lives around to solidify on God's truth and the person of Jesus Christ so that that is what holds it all together even when we're not feeling it. Because I don't know about you, I need habits, patterns, rituals, repetitive words that continue to reorient my mind even when my emotions are absent and possibly I need them more during those times. 
And so that's kind of what I want to create for us as we continue to engage the Lord in that way. And Eucharist is one of those things that we do. That's a fancy Greek way of saying thanksgiving uh, for the Lord's Supper, which we do once every four weeks. Again, want that to be a pattern for us. Uh, I want us to continue to anchor ourselves in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. I wanna make sure that we're always pulling it back and just concentrating on essentials like scripture, the spirit, and sacraments. It doesn't have to be that complicated. And a lot of times, we just need to trust the Lord's presence. And so the sermon tonight is right there at the table. I'm not burying it. I'm just here to set the table for the Lord and pull out the chair for you guys tonight. And I prayed over each one of these tables and I pray that you'll encounter the Lord um, in an incredibly meaningful way, whether that includes your emotions or not. Because I don't know about you, sometimes the greatest act of obedience in my life comes when I choose to step into what I know is right, even when my emotions are not there to accompany me. And I'm a big feeler, so don't get me wrong. I love emotions, I love it when it all collides, but when it does not, it does not compromise my faith. It continues my faith on the doctrinal integrity laid out for us in God's word. So that's just a brief introduction to some of the things that we do here, you're welcome. Um, I want us to finish uh, reading the last verse that we did last week as you guys helped me struggle to find uh, the sermon and the Spirit blessed us by figuring out uh, a way to do that that was not um, altogether in our notes. Um, we'll be reading in Philippians chapter four, just verse one, um, as a way to set the table tonight. Philippians four, verse one. Let me pray for us before we read that together. And yes, again, everything that I'm about to say is in scripture. Holy Spirit, would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear? Jesus, would you go before us in this text and make a way? And together we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen? Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. Stand firm, thus in the Lord, my beloved. I'll say the word of the Lord if you'll say thanks be to God. The word of the Lord. Stand firm. I don't know about you, but when I picture that, I kind of try to picture my spiritual warrior, right? That's, this, you know, like you have a spirit animal. I have like a spirit warrior. Maybe it looks exactly like Jason Momo, but anyway, that's uh, not for you to know. That's between me and the Lord. And if you're laughing, I'm really hurt, but... He's standing there and he's ripped and he's buff and he can face down whatever storm is coming, long hair going through here, millions of dollars flying at me because I just did Aquaman. I'm confusing the, the issue. Anyway, I just figure that lone solitary figure who no matter what comes at him or her is able to stand the ground and remain firm, thus in the Lord. Awesome, biblically inaccurate. Why? Not because I'm not of Samoan descent, but simply because that's a plural. What a better picture would be is if I pictured the men and women who I do community with locking arms with me. And at times I'm weak and they're holding me up. And at other times I'm strong and I'm holding them up. And there's times when I'm doubting and they're believing. There's times when they're believing and I'm doubting. That's what standing firm looks like. We're interlocking our lives, our faith, our holy habits, and we have a pattern of meeting together, asking one another difficult questions, praying for one another, bearing one another's burdens, and looking each other in the eye and saying, you will not bleed alone. That's what it means to be in community and have a pattern of living out the gospel in that context. I think that Paul wants for his church and for us for them to interlock and connect their faith. It's one of the reasons why we say some of those liturgical things. We wanna interlock our voices and our hearts and we wanna agree on certain things. We wanna say them again and again to each other. Maybe a, a good picture to help explain this. If I was to tell you, I want you to build the largest structure possible and I'm either gonna give you an unlimited supply of playing cards or an unlimited supply of Legos, which one would you choose? Obviously, congratulations, you guys have all qualified for a band's placement test and IB, my son's going to high school, I'm learning about that stuff, junk, 
that I did not qualify for. Uh, <laughs> side note, my son's currently taking the math in eighth grade that I graduated 12th grade taking. Um, so we have fun talking about how the Lord has wired us differently. <laughs> um, back to the point, let's get to Legos or playing cards, right? Why would you do that? Because playing cards are ridiculously difficult to tenuously balance. If you picked Legos, you'd be right, by the way, um, not only for the purposes of our metaphor, but also for the Guinness Book of World Records. I believe currently, right now, the largest structure that was made out of a house of cards, and we have a picture of it, was used, built by 57,200 cards, and it measured 25 feet high. Pretty impressive, right? Now here's the largest Lego structure ever built. It's 42 feet tall. It's a replica of London's Tower Bridge. It used 5,805,846 bricks. I wanna know who counted that. Um, and it is large enough to hold two SUVs. Um, unfortunately, I don't know if it's unfortunate. Welcome to capitalism. Um, Land Rover paid for that to be built, which is great. <laughs> But my point in holding those two images up is it's interesting that on the Lego structure, you can park two SUVs. On the house of cards, it's in an airtight container. Why? Because the slightest breath or slightest touch, it all collapses. And I wonder what Paul wants to tell us tonight when we are stand firm together is don't build your life and community and faith on a house of cards. Or out of convenience or affinity or when you have it all together, loosely placing your life next to other people. But when the slightest of conflict or chaos enters into your life, it collapses and it's the first thing to go. I wonder if he knew what God knew and that was the human soul was designed to make connection with brothers and sisters linking arms standing firm, bearing one another's burdens, weeping with those who weep, laughing with those who laugh, and celebrating with those who celebrate. And tonight, we're gonna do that as a family. We're gonna come to the table, and we're gonna interlock our lives with one another, and we're gonna partake of the elements, because it is what Jesus called us to do until he comes again, amen? So part of our pattern here also is, I'll say, um, an abbreviated version of a liturgy that's taken out of the Book of Common Prayer. This was written around the 15th century. Um, John Wesley, who was partial, I, I know that, but he said this about the Book of Common Prayer, no other book has been written or liturgy, ancient or modern, that is more solid, scriptural, scriptural rational, or reverent than the Book of Common Prayer. And so it's just, a, once again, a collection of what Christians throughout the centuries have said, with, intermingled with scripture. And when we come to these things, I want there to be a familiarity and a reverence. And for me, familiarity doesn't displace reverence. It doesn't turn into blind, boring tradition. You can do that with anything. You can do that with something that's contemporary. You can do something that was old. But I wanna make sure that there are ruts of righteousness so that we continue to hear and understand who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Sound good? So I'll start and you guys can talk back to me. Bless the Lord who forgives all of our sins. Sound good, church. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's take a minute to confess our sins against God and against our neighbor. So this is the part where you just take inventory in your heart and acknowledge the ways that you've missed the mark, hidden from God, hurt or abandoned others 
intentionally or unintentionally. Let us pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. On the night Jesus was handed over to suffering and death, he took the bread and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, church, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. So what we'll do in just a couple minutes, um, that we practice open communion here, which means if you're a follower of Jesus and you just meant the words of that confession, you are welcome at the table. If you're new or just considering the claims of Christ, no pressure whatsoever. If you're ready to follow Christ for the first time, just come up and wink at me and say, I'm ready. And we'll assume that that means we're gonna have a side conversation, okay? Nothing would make my heart happier. Uh, but for those of us who are in the family of God, following God in imperfect and perfect ways, this is a time for us to renew our covenant vows. And the way that we do it here is we put wine, which is really grape juice. See, I told you I wasn't Catholic. Uh, too soon, okay. Serious Chris, serious Chris. Um, we take this and what you'll do is you'll come up and there's a wafer here and someone will hand it to you and they'll say the bread of life um, or the body of Christ. And when you come up, if you just put your hands out like this in a posture of receiving, that would be perfect. And when we put it in your hands, one of the things that we love to say here is, I will love and be loved. It'll be on the screens in case for those of you who are nervous and have performance anxiety when it comes to participating on a religious ritual in front of other people, uh, which I notice is a lot of you. That's all right. It took me a while. That's good. So we'll put it in your hands and then you'll come with it to the cup. Hold on to it. Don't eat it. We're not common cup folks yet. There's way too many germs. So this time of year, speaking of germs, there's also hand sanitizer at the edges all around there for those of you who want to need to avail yourselves of it. You'll dip it in the cup um, and then you can eat it right there. But each time you are offered uh, the bread or the cup, um, the person will say the cup of salvation um, or the blood of Jesus and you'll once again look them in the eyes and reply, I will love and be loved. There's something about locking eyes with your brothers and sisters when you come to the table together. This is not an anonymous individual ritualistic practice. It is the family of God coming together to the table of God. Good? So I'm gonna ask the band to come up. I'll serve them first. Megan and I will. And then I'll give you this cue, which is very pious, symbolizing the bleachers can come first. <laughs> 